Well, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2020. I'm glad that you're here. So I trust that you had a wonderful new year. So, so how many of you, when the new year came in, were already sound asleep? Come on, be honest. Be honest. All right. So the rest of you are party animals, right? And uh, I, I have to admit, I fell asleep about 1030. S- sound asleep. Sound asleep. I won't tell you the whole story, and at 10.58, it might be somebody here from the church, but at 10.58, someone right outside of our house started letting off these huge firecrackers, and all of a sudden, I was sound asleep, and all of a sudden, I hear, pop, 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 and I I have never been so scared in my entire life. And so I'm, uh, I'm glad it wasn't videoed. I hopped up, and I had no idea where I was. I thought we were under attack. I thought something was happening, and I slipped and fell on the... It's a long story. It's a long story, but I'm alive, and I'm here today, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you were here. So Vicki was gone all week, so on Monday she flew out and flew up to Wisconsin, and, and by the way, Mark had surgery. Everything went great for his surgery, and, and he's home... But I stayed home all week with Amber, and so I have gained a newfound appreciation for my wife. This lady is absolutely phenomenal. Um, Amber is alive, um, no, no hospital visits, nothing like that, but man, what, what, a, what a difficult week. And I, I was praying, so I'm this way, so when she left, I knew that from the time she left to the time she walked in the door, it was 113 hours. And so you think I'm joking, and I counted down. So I'd wake up and say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm 50 hours in. I only have 73 more hours to go or something like that. And so uh, I made it. But Vicki, I love you, and thank you so much for the way that you take care of, of uh, our daughter, Amber. What a great ministry. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you've decided to start this new year in church. And uh, I'm excited about what God's doing in my life. And I'm excited about what God is doing at Hollywood Community Church. And we're going to be saying more about that in the next couple of weeks. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 today. So today we begin a new series that we're simply calling, I Love the Church. And we'll read Matthew 16 in just a few moments. But our country is filled with churches. You know that. The last estimate that I read was that there are 330,000 different churches in the United States. You know as well as I do, there are big churches and there are little churches. There are churches that have been around for hundreds of years, and there are new churches that are being started every week. I heard this week about a brand new church that was being started in, in Pembroke Pines, There are contemporary churches, and there are traditional churches. There are churches that meet in houses, churches that meet in strip malls, churches that meet in movie theaters, churches that meet in schools, and churches that meet in church buildings like ours. In the last several decades, though, church attendance in our country has declined. Several generations ago, you will remember, especially those of us that have a little bit of age, several generations ago, almost everybody attended church. And not only did almost everybody attend church, but almost everybody attended church every week. That's not the case now. Church attendance continues to decrease in our country. And the amazing thing is, and and here's one of the things George Barn and other statisticians that that are actually working with us here in South Florida have made this determination. They've said that not only are less people attending church, but people are now attending church less. Does that make sense? Not only are less people attending church, but people are now attending church less. When, when the average faithful person used to attend 45 to 50 Sundays out of the year, now it's estimated that the most faithful people attend 35 Sundays out of the year. And that's affecting the impact that the church has 
gospel in our culture. In addition, there's a movement. You maybe have heard of this movement. There's a movement of people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, but just don't attend church. They claim to be believers. They claim to be followers of the Lord, but church is not important to them. As a matter of fact, they would make this statement, and there's a YouTube video out there that's been seen by millions of people where someone basically says, I love Jesus, but I just don't love the church. Let me ask you today, is that possible? Is it truly possible to not, or to love Jesus and not love His church? That's like looking at me and telling me today, Brian, you know what? We really like you. We just don't like your wife very much. How would I respond to that? Would I look at you and say, yeah, I get it. She gets on my nerves too. I I get that. No, I wouldn't say that. That would be offensive to me. Uh, I mean, mean, we're one flesh. To not like my wife is to what? Is to not like me. And so to tell me that you love me, but you don't love my wife, doesn't compliment me, rather it offends me. And by the way, that's not what most people say. Most people say that they love Vicky, but they don't love me. And so that was just an uh, illustration. Let me ask you this morning. Do you love the church? I want you to allow that question to kind of bounce between your ears for just a few moments. And in your heart, do you love the church? How important is the church to you? And when you hear those questions, you may ask, okay, Brian, so what is the church anyways? You're talking about the church universal? You're talking about the church local? You're talking about our church? You're talking about somebody else's church? You're talking about the Baptist church? You're talking about the Catholic church? What are you talking about? And I get that, and we're going to try to answer those questions in the next couple of weeks. But maybe you sit back and say, how do I really demonstrate my love for the church? As I mentioned, those are questions that we want to answer in the next few weeks. Our theme for 2020 is this. I love the church. And here's our desire. I want you to know from the very beginning what our desire is. And both our elder board and our our staff, we spent a lot of time thinking and praying about this. Here is our desire. Our desire is this. For the Holy Spirit of God to to kindle in your heart and in my heart, not just a refire, as it were, a reigniting of our love for Jesus, but that He would reignite in our hearts as well a love, a passion for His church. So today we begin looking at I love the church from a scriptural point of view. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, we're going to find a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples in which he begins to address the church for the very first time. So Matthew chapter 16, notice beginning of verse 13, you can follow along in your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, or we'll put it up on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 16, 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Let me pause there for a second. Here's what Jesus, he looks at the disciples and he says, what is everyone saying about me? Now before you think, oh my word, Jesus had an inferiority complex. Jesus was probably one of those guys that checked his Facebook status on a regular basis to see how many likes he had. Uh, That's not what Jesus is asking in the passage because, quite frankly, his identity is not found in whether you like him or I like him or even what we think about him. So when Jesus asked the disciples, who do others say the Son of Man is, he's not asking for himself, rather he's asking for them. Because he realizes that their view of Jesus is the most important thing in their life. And so he looks at his disciples and he says, Who do people say that I am? 
verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, they're saying, hey, you know what? People think that you're one of the prophets that came back from the dead. So we know that John the Baptist had just been killed frequently, and some people are saying that, that, John, that you're John the Baptist who's risen from the dead, and others are saying that you're Elijah, and others are saying you're Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets. Verse 15, but Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Let me pause there because I think that might be the most important question in life. The most important question is not in life is not who are you, who will you marry, what will you do? The most important question in life for you and me very simply is this, who is Jesus to you? Imagine if you were Jesus standing here with us today and Brian's not asking that question, but Jesus looks at you and he asks you this question, who am I to you? What do you think of me? Well, you can imagine who was the first one to respond. The first one to respond was Peter. And Peter blurts out right away. Peter, said, Peter replied, why, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, if you know anything about Peter, Peter got it wrong a lot of times. Peter put his foot in his mouth often. But Peter didn't get it wrong this time. Peter's answer was right on point. He looks at Jesus and he says, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. Oh, I took that phrase this morning and I prayed over and over again that God the Father would reveal Jesus to us in a way that's fresh and new. He did that to Peter. And I will tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, now let's be aware, Jesus was not saying that he would build his church on Peter. That's not what the text is saying. Rather, the text is saying, Peter, I will build my church on the declaration that you just made. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, well said, Peter, because it is on that statement that I will build my church. Notice what he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 20 is a little bit of a confusing verse. Then Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them, don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. And we ask, why would he say that? And the simple truth was, it wasn't time yet. He, he wasn't telling them, don't ever tell anybody but I, that I'm the Christ. But he's saying it's not time yet for you to make that declaration. But this morning, I want us to con concentrate our thoughts on that one phrase that Jesus makes where he says this, I will build my church. Would you pray with me today? Father, I, I thank you so much for your presence with us today. Thank you that we don't have to beg you to come. We don't have to coerce you to come. But you've promised us that wherever there's a small group of believers, that you are there in the midst of them. We thank you for that. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And I pray today more than uh, us hearing what Brian says today. Lord, I pray that we would hear that inner voice of the Holy Spirit of God convicting us, encouraging us, challenging us, reminding us how important the church is to you and how much you love it. And I pray that we would come to love the church as you love it. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you have your outline in front of you, just a couple of things. The first thing we say very simply is this. The church is founded upon 
and directed or led by Jesus Christ. The church is founded upon and led by Jesus Christ. Now, you know as well as I do that today's society is filled with a lot of benevolent organizations, a lot of fantastic organizations that were, that were founded with the noblest of intentions, organizations that feed the poor, organizations that clothe the unclothed, organizations that find homes for the homeless. Many of these organizations were founded by tremendous men and women who had a heart of compassion and a willingness to serve others. We could talk today about the Salvation Army. We could talk today about uh, the Negro College Fund. We could talk today about World Vision. We could talk today about Samaritan's Purse. All of those are fantastic organizations that were founded by individuals that saw a need and raised up an organization to meet a need. All of those organizations give generously to help and change the lives of others. But here's what I want you to catch, though. As helpful as all of those organizations are, they cannot take the place of the church. You see, the church is unique from all of those groups. The church is unique from any other Christian organization that you and I can mention or any other organization. The church is unique simply because it is the only organization that was founded by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said, I will build my church. Pronoun my, put in by Jesus Christ. Occasionally, someone calls the office and asks us this question. I always think it's a humorous question, but I get it frequently. Brian, who owns Hollywood Community Church? And, and, and I have people talk to me, you, you, you know, Brian, you know that church? I've even had people say that church that you own. Something like that. Listen, I want you to know, I, I don't own Hollywood Community Church. <laughs> All right? I wish I did sometimes, but I don't. Hollywood Community Church doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to our pastoral staff. It doesn't belong to our elder board. The correct answer is this, that this church, Hollywood Community Church, and any church that preaches the gospel belongs to Jesus Christ. It is His church. It's not mine. I have the privilege of being designated one of the pastors, but if you look at 1 Peter chapter 5, there is a pastor that's, that's above all of us, and it's Jesus Christ who is listed as the chief shepherd, as the chief pastor might be good in our staff listing. Everybody would think we were probably weird, but it might be good, you know, to list Brian Burkholder in my title and Jose in his title and Brad in his title. And above all of that, put Jesus Christ, chief pastor, CEO of Hollywood Community Church. Why is that? It's his church. He started it. Matthew 16, 18, once again, I will build my church. I was thinking about that today, and I thought, you know what? I don't think I would want to be part of a church that wasn't founded by Jesus. I don't think I would want to be part of a church that wasn't based on Jesus. I wouldn't want to be part of a church that didn't have as his purpose what Jonas and the team just sang about just a few moments ago. All glory be to Christ. That's the purpose. That's what Jesus is talking about in the passage. He says, I will build my church. The Apostle Paul makes the same statement in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 when he says, He, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So in everything we do at Hollywood Community Church, our goal is that what? That Jesus might be preeminent. If you look at our vision, our vision very simply is this. Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. He is the preeminent one. It's interesting if we were exegeting the passage, and we're not doing that in the message this morning, but if we were exegeting the passage, you would notice that Jesus links the church in this passage to his suffering, to his death, and to his resurrection. Because in the very next segment, in verse 21, it makes this statement. It says, from that time, from what time? From the time that Jesus said that he would build his church, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed 
and on the third day be raised. Here's what I want you to catch. The church was founded by Jesus Christ, led by Jesus Christ, and has the purpose uh, and the vision of taking the message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in making disciples of Jesus. So the first thing we see is this. The church was founded upon and is led by Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing I want you to see if you have your outline in front of you. It's this. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. And the church is not a denomination. Think with me. Let's kind of flesh that out just a little bit. First of all, the church is not a building. You might sit back and say, wait a second, didn't we come today to Hollywood Community Church? Isn't where we are today, isn't this building Hollywood Community Church? And quite frankly, I have to confess that we, even as leaders, innocently and incorrectly teach others about the nation or the nature of the church. We talk about the church as if it were a place to go. But the church is not a building. We talk about going to church. We talk about inviting people to our church. We have a sign out front that says Hollywood Community Church. And when you walked in the door, probably one of our first impressions team today told, told you, welcome to Hollywood Community Church. I grew up, did anybody ever learn this? I grew up saying this when I was just a little kid in Sunday school. They used to do this. Anybody remember this? So we'd put your fingers together like this, and we would say, here's the church, and here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people. All right, did you ever do that? Did you ever do that? So that, the, that's the way we were taught. Okay, here's the church right here. And of course, any church has to have a steeple. So here's the church and here's the steeple. And you open the door and in the church are all the people. I know that's a cute little thing that we teach kids, but we're actually teaching something that's not correct. We're teaching that the church is a building. And the church is not a building. I'm grateful that we have a beautiful building that we can meet in. We can have air conditioning, even though today we might not need the air conditioning, but we have air conditioning and we have uh, semi-comfortable seats and we have running water and we have all of that. I'm grateful for this building, but if this building fell down today, Hollywood Community Church would continue to exist because Hollywood Community Church is not a building. Notice the second thing. The church is not a program. It's not a program. Churches become a set of programs that we offer to people. We judge churches based upon what they offer. Successful churches offer a lot, we think, and unsuccessful churches don't offer as much. Visitors often look more at what a church offers than what a church teaches. We, we talk about the importance of a children's program or a youth ministry or a millennial program or a senior adult program or a feeding ministry or a benevolent program. And don't get me wrong, those are wonderful things and I'm thrilled as a ministry that we offer all of those things. But the church is not a set of programs. Believe it or not, the church can exist without a children's ministry taking the children out of the service. And the church can't exist without other programs. It actually did it for centuries and generations. The church is not a program. It's not a building. Thirdly, the church is not a denomination. People often say, I belong to the Baptist church. Or if you ask somebody where they attend, they look at it and say, well, I'm Lutheran. Or, or I'm Methodist. Or I'm Episcopalian. Or, or I'm Catholic. Or I'm this, and we understand what they're saying, but we speak as though the church were a denomination. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that denominations serve a purpose. They clarify what we call secondary issues. They clarify baptism. Denominations clarify the Lord's Supper. They, they clarify church government. That's what denominations do. Uh, but I want you to note that the church of Jesus Christ transcends denominations. 
That's why I'm such a fan of Church United because we're able to bring churches from all of these different denominations together and we're able to be in the same room and lock arms and declare, we are the Church, capital C, of Jesus Christ. The Church is not a denomination. We uphold our differences. We rejoice in our differences. But we don't let our differences divide us. So you might suspect it and say, okay, so Brian, help me out here. If the church isn't a building, and the church isn't a program, and the church isn't a denomination, what is the church? I'm glad you asked that, because that's our third point. Here it is. The church is the people of God. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. The church is not a denomination. The church is the people of God. Here's what we mean. You are the church. Say it with me today. I am the church. Say it like you mean it. I am the church. Look at the person beside you and tell them you are the church. The church is people. So, 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 So the church is when God's people come together and meet together. The Greek word that's used here in Matthew chapter 16 and is used throughout the New Testament is the word ekklesia. Ekklesia is a word meaning called out. Specifically, it is being called out of one's home to gather together in public. Early Christians took it to mean individuals called out from their lives in the world, called out from the world called to be a part of God's glorious kingdom. It's important that we realize that. Called out. God, as as the people of God, He has taken us from the world and He has called us out to form a new entity that is called the church. So here's what I want you to get. I want to give you a definition today. It's in your notes, and it's a definition that we'll work from uh, the rest of the month. But the church, but the definition is this: the church is the people of God, both universal and local, who have been saved through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, and who are called to live in community. Okay, can I can I read that again? The church is the people of God both universal and local, who have been saved through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and who are called to live in community. We talk about universal, we talk about the church worldwide. So, so, so the, this morning my oldest son is, is preaching in La Iglesia Reforma in Guatemala City, Guatemala. You know what's meeting there this morning? The church of Jesus Christ. And, and Mark today is pastoring Cedar Creek Community Church up in Grafton, Wisconsin. It's freezing up there. But you know who's meeting up there? The Church of Jesus Christ. And in churches dotted all throughout Broward County, guess who is meeting together? It is the Church Universal. It is the Church of Jesus Christ. We call it Big C Church. But all of us are local expressions of the universal church. We can call it Little C Church. So here at Hollywood Community Church, we're Little C Church that forms part of the Big C Church. We're a local community that forms part of the universal body of Jesus Christ. Now it's really interesting, and I know we might be getting a little deep this morning, but it's really interesting because you enter the universal church and the local church almost the exact same way. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Why? You enter the universal church through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And the moment you repent of your sin and you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, at that moment you're declared righteous in the sight of God just as if you never sinned and you are baptized into the Holy Spirit. So you become a part of the universal church by repentance, faith, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You become a part of the local church by repentance repenting of your sins by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and by water baptism. Water baptism is what? It's a demonstration of what God is doing in your life. 
I, I would pause and say that today, that if you're here this morning and there's never been a time that you have followed the Lord with, in believer's baptism, that is an identification. It's a statement of saying, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I am not ashamed of it. We would encourage you to do so. Just as you were baptized into the universal church, we encourage you to be baptized into the local church. And the last part of that phrase is this, we are called to live in community. Brad's going to flesh that out in just a couple of weeks out of Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, that talks about the fact that we have been called to live in community. So here's what I want you to catch, so just a couple of metaphors, and I know we're laying a foundation today, but... It's interesting, there, there are three main metaphors that are used in the New Testament or three main illustrations that are used to demonstrate the importance of the church. And I want you to get these, okay? The first is this, if you have your notes in front of you, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What a, what a challenge for us as husbands. We're to love our wives, how? Just as Jesus loved the church. Just as, guys, our wives are to be our, our girlfriends, our brides for all of our lives, Jesus says, so I love the church as my bride. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The church is the bride of Christ. Would you say that with me today? We are the bride of Christ. Say that with me. We are the bride of Christ. Man, can you think of anything more valuable to Jesus Christ than his own bride. He tells us the church is so important to me that it's my bride. There's a second metaphor that's used throughout the New Testament, and it's this. The church is a body of believers. A church is a body of believers. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about this next Sunday, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, Paul says this. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. I love verse 27, it says this, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Would you say with me today, we are the body of Christ. Say it with me. We are the body of Christ. Again, we are the body of Christ. So, so here's, what, here, here's what the scriptures tell us. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is not only the bride of Christ, but the church is the body of Christ. And next week, I can't wait to delve into this because as a body, a body has all kinds of different members, right? So you're looking at me, I got two ears, one nose, one mouth, two hands, 10 fingers, two knees, two hips, 10 toes, all of that. Every one of those different parts of my body are important. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, saying, you are important to the body of Christ. And for you to minimize your importance hurts the body. We are the body of Christ. Here's the third metaphor that's used throughout Scripture, and this is my favorite. It's this, the church is a family. The church is a family. I believe it beautifully illustrates how the local church should function as a family. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. He says, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. I just spoke in Spanish a few moments ago, and the word that's translated household in the Spanish translations is this, the family of faith. So here's what Paul is saying. We're part of a family. Would you say that with me today? We're family. Say that with me. We're family. We are the family of God. The person beside you is your brother 
or sister in Christ. As a matter of fact, look at the person beside you and say, you're my brother or sister. Would you do that? That's a little awkward. Some of you are looking at your wife saying, am I supposed to call her my sister? I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's correct or not. We're family. We're family. We've all heard the phrase that blood is thicker than water, right? We've heard that phrase. But I would submit to you today that the church of Jesus Christ, united by the Holy Spirit of God, is thicker than blood. The relationship that we have with one another transcends this life. And as part of the family of God, the relationship that we have with one another is so special. What joins us together as I look out over our congregation, one of the things I love about HCC is I love the diversity of HCC. We, we haven't counted recently. I would love to count how many different nationalities make up our congregation, but we are a uniquely diverse bunch of people. I love that. But we have people that have come from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different ways of talking, different ways of thinking. Boy, let me tread on scary ground here. Different political parties. Let me go a little bit further. It's even more difficult. Different sports teams that we root for. <laughs> Within this body, we have UM fans and we have UF fans. You say, Brian, how in the world can UM fans fellowship with UF fans? That is only a work of the Holy Spirit of God. That is only the only way that it's possible. What are we? We're a family. We're a family who have been brought together by the truth of the gospel, united by the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. As I look out over this congregation today, here, I, I'm not seeing a group of diverse people, even though you are. I'm not seeing a group of good-looking people, even though the majority of you are. <laughs> Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing temples of the Holy Spirit of God. I am seeing individuals who have been redeemed by the grace of God, whose lives have been changed by the gospel and who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And what unites us, catch this church, what unites us, it's so much greater than what divides us. We are family. We're a part of God's family. When Jesus says, I will build my church, he's talking about his bride. He's talking about his body. He's talking about his family. Let me share you one further truth, and then we'll wrap this up today. The fourth thing is this. The church is temporarily imperfect. The church is temporarily imperfect. Scripture repeatedly tells us that we're all sinners, that none of us are righteous. As a matter of fact, Paul says it this way, no, not one. I love the Spanish translation. It says, ni siquiera uno. Not even one. There's not one righteous person. We are all sinners saved by grace. Imperfect people who God has graciously allowed into his bride, into his body, into his family. Now while we are being perfected and the job of the Holy Spirit of God is to perfect us and so while we are being perfected while we are being made pure we need to realize that we are temporarily imperfect I say that because to expect the church to be perfect is unrealistic it's absolutely impossible to make a perfect church with imperfect people does that make sense let me say it again it's impossible to make a perfect church with imperfect people. The, the, David Hughes, pastor of Church by the Glades, is one of our friends, and, and uh, their, their motto of their church is this. You probably have seen it. No perfect people allowed. As if 
perfect people existed. Perfect people don't exist. God's church is made up of imperfect people. Now, I've had you turn to your neighbor and say your brother or sister, your family. I'm not going to have you turn to your neighbor and say you're imperfect, all right? I'm not going to have you do that. But you are surrounded by imperfect people. And you yourself are imperfect to the people around you. The church is temporarily imperfect. I say that for a reason. I say that for a reason. Be aware of the fact that it's highly possible that someone here in this congregation might offend you in the future. The building might not be as up-to-date as you would like. It's not as up-to-date as I would like. All right? The music may not be exactly what you want. And the pastor might get on your nerves every now and then. I get it. I live with him 24-7. He gets on my nerves too. All right? I get all of that. But here's what I'm asking, church. Here's what I'm asking, family. Here's what I'm asking, body. Let's be gracious to one another. Let's be patient in times of misunderstanding. Place your eyes on the vision. Place your eyes on what God is doing. Place your eyes on the task that God has given us to perform as a church. And don't let a person, don't let an incident, don't let a disappointment separate you from the church where God has placed you, from the family in which God has placed you. Decide to commit to a family. Decide to commit to a church that is founded on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. See, as I look out over our congregation, you say, Brian, what... What excites you about Hollywood Community Church? And I've been here, so this year I'll, I'll complete 10 years here. And I want you to know I, I'm excited, and why is that? Because I see, I see God doing an unbelievable work, and, and you guys never get to see from here out, so I get to see from here out. But not only do I get to see from here out, but I know the great majority of you, and I know what God is doing in your lives I have the privilege of being there at the bad times and I have the privilege of being there at the good times. I have the privilege of being there when you're struggling and when we need the, you know, um, like we say in Spanish, jalarte las orejas, all right? And I have the privilege of being there and rejoicing with you when you see God do something great in and through your life. And I'm so excited about what God is doing in our midst but I'm even more excited about the potential that is outside the doors of this church because God has placed us in one of the most needy areas of Broward County. You said, Brian, elaborate on that. We probably will in the next few weeks. But God has placed us right in the middle of ground zero to do ministry. We are his body whom he has placed here for the purpose of being Jesus to our community. What an awesome privilege. What an awesome responsibility we have. You are the church. Say it with me today. I am the church. We are the church. Say it with me. We are the church. As the church were the bride of Christ, we're the body of Christ, and we're the family of Jesus Christ. Vicki's going to come, and, and we're going to sing one of my favorites. As the pastor, every once in a while, I get to do what I like, and so I like to hear Vicki sing, so Vicki's going to come. Not that I don't like to hear Jonas and Rachel. I love everybody, but, but I love. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and we want to end singing the song that many of you are familiar with. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I want you to sing that. So before Vicki sings that, let me say this. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life when you've done this, please listen, please catch me. There's never been a moment in your life where you have repented of your sin. 
when you have reached out by faith to Jesus and Jesus alone, I invite you today to accept Jesus and to become a part of the church. Big C, I invite you to do that. We'll have some of our leaders down front. There's nothing that they would love more than to take the Word of God and show you how you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven, to know for sure that Jesus is your Savior. If you've never done that, I'd invite you to do that. If you're here today and say, Brian, man, I, I know I've repented of my sin. I know I'm a follower of Jesus, but I have never identified with His church through water baptism. And I would like to do that. That's a part of the Great Commission. It's a command that He's given to us. I believe at the very least, it's the first step in our salvation. It demonstrates that we're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, I'd encourage you to do that. If you've done both of that, man, if you want to, lock arms with the people beside you. And let's sing as a testimony today. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What's the alternative? The alternative is to not be a part of his family. So I'm so glad today that I'm a part of his family. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We realize today that all of this is possible only because of Jesus Christ. He's our pastor. He's our chief shepherd. He's our founder. The rock upon which our church and your church has been established. He's our leader. He's our Lord. And we submit to him today. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your family. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we can pray with you, we'd love to have the opportunity to do that. You sing and worship with Vicki.